So we talked about uh, the, the stresses and strains in pavement uh, systems for different setups, the two layer, uh, three layer, multi-layer systems. And we, we learned how to analyze the stresses and strains as well as displacements in the pavement systems um, using the can layer and can pave software packages. Now, uh, those are the analysis part of the design, uh, the, the analysis part of the pavement system. Now we want to know how do we design the pavement layers. And by design, we mean we want to know what are the thicknesses of each layers and what type of material, we, we, what type of strengths we need for different layers, let's say the surface layer, and uh, the basis of space and also the subgrade. So uh, again, uh, a quick uh, flashback to the beginning of the semester. Uh, we said that the pavement, the typical flexible pavement is, and these are, we're gonna talk about the, the flexible design first. And then uh, if you have time, we can talk about the, the rigid pavement design as well. So for the flexible, we have usually the asphalt layer at the top and then we have the base sometimes the sub base right below the asphalt layer and then we have uh, the subgrade layer again this is familiar from the analysis part that you've already practiced uh, with the manual calculation and also with the um, can pave and can layer uh, software now, for the design part, we want to know what would be the thickness of each of these layers, right? And what type of materials in terms of, uh, if you're looking at modulus elasticity uh, for different layers, if you look at the, the properties, uh, for example, the new, um, the Poisson ratio, for each layer and also uh, what type of material if you're looking at the linear or nonlinear behavior of the material. So we need to define these in our design process, right? So if you look at the, the different design criteria, we also need to know the load and these are basically from traffic loads right so one essential part of the design is to estimate what are the traffic loads and how we can estimate the traffic loads and then we need to define what are the thicknesses and properties of each layer uh, to be able to transfer the load to the bottom layers right now if you look at the the history of pavement design systems or uh, methods. Um, so pavement design methods. It started with Asphalt Institute. Uh, a long time ago, they proposed a method for design of the flexible pavements. This was specifically for flexible pavements. Then there was another design process provided by National Stone Association. Um, and then the, the oil company Shell, they also provided, because they are related to the production of the binder, asphalt binder, they also proposed a method for the flexible pavement design. And then the one that we will be focusing today was provided by ASHTO. Everybody is familiar with ASHTO, American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials. And this was first, 
proposed in 1993 and the last revision for this program was proposed in 1998 and after that they moved to the the, the, the first version of the system or the design process that we already have. So the first version was called mechanistic empirical pavement design guide. or it used to be known as MEPDG. So in terms of the evolution of the pavement design systems, we can basically follow this trend over the years. And this was uh, started in early 2000s. And uh, the first version came out in 2004 and then and the latest one that we will be using for our, hopefully for our final project will be, uh, is called, they slightly changed the name and now it's called Pavement ME or Pavement Mechanistic Empirical Design uh, Process for Pavements. And it, it is again provided by Ashto and this time they call it Ashto Ver. It's a software provided by Ashto. Okay, so um, we, we slightly talked talk about this uh, at the beginning of the semester that uh, the older versions up until this point, they were all, so most of these, they were using experimental or empirical design methods. Right. And by that, we mean that most of the design process, pretty much all of the design process was based on the results of lab tests, as well as field evaluations. And if you remember, we showed the, the largest scale um, field data collections in Minnesota and uh, Alabama that they, they use for um, the uh, for the pavement evaluation or the large scale pavement evaluations. But the only difference or the major difference that they wanted to move towards an ME approach or a mechanistic empirical approach is that they wanted to combine the empirical method with the mechanistic Approach. And by mechanistic approach, we mean that we are incorporating the, the analysis of stress and strains or the pavement. Right? So the, the, in the MEPDG or the pavement ME method, not only we are relying on empirical methods or empirical results, they're also using the mechanistic or mechanical based on mechanics of material um, concepts to evaluate the response of the pavement under different types of loading, right? So these two, uh, we're gonna see that the, the Ashto method and also uh, the pavement ME, the, the mechanistic empirical pavement design guide um, are basically in every aspect of the design, they, they will be different. Now, what we're going to talk about today is we are going to overview uh, or have a quick overview of the Ashto method that they are still, even though uh, they don't support it anymore. And Ashto specifically mentioned that they have used or they have uh, migrated to the to the new system 
but it's still some cities and counties and even some DOTs, they are still using Astro Pavement Design. So if you see somewhere, or if you're involved in a project that says the pavement design approach is still following Ashto design method, this is referring to the design method uh, that was last modified in 1998. Okay, so first of all, we need to know the factors that affect the pavement design. These are pretty much um, material characteristics. Right. We have construction what type of construction method we are using to build the pavement system, um, the traffic loads, the repeated traffic loads, and also the environmental factors. Yes. The precipitation, um, the number of days freezing, the number of freezing days, and also uh, what type of other environmental or climate conditions you are trying to, to build the pavements on. All right, now uh, one uh, criteria before starting to look into the pavements uh, design system, one criteria that we evaluate the performance of the pavement uh, or serviceability is called pavement serviceability. or PSI. This is important for evaluating the, 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 the performance of the pavements structures um, as they are underlying the traffic loads. And we evaluate the PSI index um, to maintain and to find out what type of rehabilitation and repair process we probably need for our pavement system in the network. Um, even though this, this is a relatively uh, old concept, but there is still uh, and a lot of cities and, and counties around the country, they are still using the PSI to rate um, the performance of their systems or uh, pavements in, the, in their uh, street networks or even highway network. Now, we need to know how the, the PSI and TSI works because this is uh, going to be affecting our design process as well. Okay. So if you look at the x-axis as the traffic loads um, that's increasing over time, and then the y-axis will be PSI. The PSI is changing, um, the range of PSI is changing from zero to five. And zero is, is basically failure, no, no service is available. Um, on the pavement surface and five is the best condition, uh, which is the optimal condition if, right after the construction, right? Okay, so if you look at this one as this is number one, two, three, four, and five. If you look at a, a, a new pavement, even a new pavement might not be at a perfect five. And right after construction, because the construction is not always perfect, it starts somewhere around here, right? Right. So that's going to be our initial PSI right after construction. And then uh, we have 
two two uh, thresholds or margin of uh, error that be below those we need to start thinking about the maintenance process and what our pavements are going through in terms of performance okay so going back to the new pavement let's say we have a new pavement uh, and we are monitoring the performance of the pavement in terms of psi over time as the traffic as more traffic is uh, going or passing on over the pavement layers uh, the psi starts to decrease right and it it'll be after some time let's say five years it's going to be at the psi level two and we know this because we can evaluate the psi by visual inspection and there are some other um, methods that you can evaluate the psi there's it that there's actually a mathematical equation that you can calculate the psi based on the the percentage of cracks it's it's very similar to what we did for your um for one of your assignments that you looked at the google images uh and rated the the severity of the pavement cracks it's very similar to that process basically the engineers or technicians go outside and check out the the pavement surface and sometimes it is automated using a van uh, taking pictures and videos of the pavements pavement surface and then a software will calculate based on the number of cracks and the severity of cracks, the, the software will calculate the PSI or serviceability index, right? So after we calculate the, the, the PSI, um, let's say five years after the construction, we, and we see that the, the current PSI is at two, uh, and by the way, this is unit less. We know that we need a, a quick maintenance or repair uh, strategy or rehabilitation strategy right at this point, right? So if we do the repair, we right after the repair, we are instantly increasing the PSI to a higher level, right? And then by time, if we wait another five years, it will go down again to the to the critical level of the PSI, right? Now at this point, uh, we call this terminal serviceability index or PSI and we need this for the design process I'm going to show you how we are going to use TSI for the design process and also we need to know what is the initial PSI. So the initial PSI, uh, this is going to be the PSI pavement, which is usually around 4.2 to 4.5, right? And then if you look at the TSI range, um, the TSI, uh, for interstate highways, so TSI, the state highways, and also for principal arterials. These are major urban streets. The the maximum allowable. Uh, PSI, TSI is 2.5 to 3. That means that you don't want your pavement uh, PSI falling below 2.5 or 3 for an interstate highway or if you have a principal interior uh, or arterial in your urban street network. But if you have a local road, you might be able to allow uh, a little bit more Or your PSI to drop. So your TSI for local roads will be around two, right? 
if you have a local road, because you have less traffic and, and probably it's less critical compared to a highway, to, a, to an interstate highway system or a major arterial, you can allow uh, for the PSI or for the TSI to drop uh, to a lower level, right? Now, have this in mind um, because we are gonna use this, the PSI and TSI in our equation uh, for the ASHTO pavement design process. Okay, now, again, these are, consider these as a side note for the design process. And then now we can jump into the design process right away. Okay, so ASHTO, pavement design, for flexible pavements. Um, and the, we emphasize this for flexible pavements because there are there's another equation for rigid pavements that uh, we can show later on. Okay, so um, it's it's a pretty long equation and uh, we again we don't need to memorize any of any part of the equation it's just a matter of how we use the equation and how we understand different parameters in the equations okay so it is based on the the traffic load which we call it W18, and we're gonna discuss what is W18. VR times S naught plus 36 of Minus two plus log ten of delta psi over two point seven. Divided by point N ninety four divided by S N plus one five to the power nineteen. I'm gonna write the rest here. Plus two point thirty two. Okay, so again, this is a, a quite long equation, and there's this is another uh, reminder uh, that we call the Ashto system empirical because you see that how one equation they came up with one equation after many laboratory and field uh, data collection, and they came up with this equation that um, should supposedly work for all different types of flexible pavements. Now, what are the parameters in this equation that we need to know and we need to calculate or estimate? The first one is W18, which is the traffic load. But, it, but we want to have a unified or a unique scale for the traffic load. Uh, so for example, if you have a, a bunch of trucks or a number of trucks in your traffic combination and also a, a number of semi-trailers and trailers, as well as regular passenger cars, you probably cannot add them all together because you're basically adding uh, apples and oranges and you, you cannot add them because they are not in the same unit or scale. Uh, so first you need to convert everything to a uniform or to a standard axle loading format. And they came up with this uh, 
standard axle load, which is the 18 kip equivalent single axle load. Now, see the equivalent single axle load, we call it ESL or ESAL. Okay. And then um, I'm going to show you what or how we calculate ESLs uh, for different types of or different combinations of, of traffic. ZR is basically a, a, a reliability level or how reliable your design is or how what is the margin of error in your design because you're not 100% sure that your design is is accurate and also you're not 100% sure that your traffic is accurate and also you're not 100% sure that your material properties that you evaluated in the lab are accurate so you need to apply a reliability level or a confidence level to show that um, you are this much away uh, from the accuracy or from the optimal accuracy. Um, this is basically the Z statistic. 